In today's video, I want to talk about a recursion and what is it, what is it used for and why should you consider it? But first things first, let's create a couple of functions. Let's say here we have, um, I don't know, let's say we have f that simply prints hello from f, right? And then we have uh, a function g and says print f hello from g. All right, and uh, then you're like, okay, well, I can call them in main. So I can say f and then g. And if I try to launch this, I'm going to see, well, both of the lines printed on the terminal here. Hello from f, hello from g. That works. Okay, amazing. But let's say I want to have g be called by f instead. So that I only have to write an f call and I can write it here, a g call inside the f function. And as a result, we'll get the same thing. All right, it's just that well, the order matters because G is not defined here, so we should actually uh, paste it here instead, but we do get the same result. Now, what happens? Well, you know that F is a function and uh, G is a function, right? We have here G being called from within another function. Well, since G is a function, can't we actually call F since it is also a function so that inside the F function, we actually call it self can we do that well if we try to call f inside its own function and then call it firstly in the main function we're gonna end up with a recursive function and if we try to launch this you're gonna notice that it forever and ever and ever prints out hello from f to the point where it crashes my program actually um yeah so that's something but it's not amazing because it's doing it forever and ever so what's the solution here for now let's forget about the g function we don't need it anymore we only have a, an, a function that is now recursive but it recurs it's recursive but it never stops executing now we know that we can pass arguments to our f function we can say here let's say int x and then let's well since we have to call it here let's pass x further down the line and inside the main function, we can pass in whatever. Let's say we pass in 20. Okay, so that's working. And let's say in the print f here, in the function, we say with x equals percent d, and we actually print out the x value. Okay, then what's going to happen? Well, if I launch this again, I'm going to get something, but it's not great. It still kind of uh, breaks my ID here, but it does... Uh, forever execute and it never really changes x is forever 20 okay but one thing is interesting here that we are not forced to actually pass in the exact parameters that we have here inside our function so here since well we do get the x variable with its value to be print on the screen but when you pass it down the line you are not forced to actually pass it as it is, we can do any operations with it. We can, for example, decrement it by one. Now what happens? So if I launch this, I'm gonna get, again, it's gonna forever execute, but at least the X value is always changing. It's always going uh, lower and lower and lower below zero, right? So we started with 20, 20 got into the first call of f we probably printed 20 but we didn't see it because it was way too fast but then we passed to the next call of our f function we passed in 20 minus 1 which is 19 so that got printed on the screen and then we passed in 19 minus 1 because at that point in the second iteration x was 19 then 18 and so on now, how do we make this recursive function actually stop executing at some point? Because having a function that executes forever and ever, basically nothing at this point, uh, doesn't really help. Well, we can have what is called an exit condition for our recursive function. And we can see here, if x is less than zero, right? So if we went into the negatives, let's say just return. What does that mean? Well, that means that when x is zero, then this is gonna be false. So it's gonna still print zero on the screen, and then it's gonna call it with zero minus one, which is minus one. And then the next time it comes along, 
and try to execute f of minus 1, then this is true, and all the function does is just return, print nothing on the screen, and not call itself again. So when I launch this, you're going to notice that the program actually successfully stops executing at x equals 0. Right? So we have all the values of x from 20 to 0, and then it stops. This is the main structure of a recursive function. We have here the main code, whatever you do with the variable that you're working with. Then you have the recursive call. So here you call the function that you're in, right? Uh, the recursive function itself with whatever arguments you have to pass in here. Usually they should be changed. And then you also have an exit condition so that the function doesn't forever execute. And the exit condition for me, it was just that the x was less than zero. Now, this is all theoretical. We don't do anything with these arguments. We don't do anything with this exit condition. We just print something on the screen. But this could actually be very useful in certain situations. Now, things actually get much more interesting if you start returning values from these recursive functions. So suppose that instead of void, we actually return an integer. And well, we're going to have to return in uh, two paths here because we really have two paths. We have this if, which returns straight up, and then we have this part, which should return also something. In here, let's say we just return, for example, zero, right? And then inside here, what if we return the result of the next call down the line? So we can simply say return f of x minus one. That's actually valid because f, well, the compiler says, okay, well, what does this return? Well, this returns an integer, right? So calling f should give me an integer, which corresponds with the integer that we have to return in the current function. So that's all fine, right? Now, if I try to take the result of this and print it on the screen, so say result equals that, and let's say print f the result of calling f is percent percent d backslash n, and we just simply say here result. If I try to launch this now, what are we gonna get? We got zero as a result. Now, why is that? Hmm. Well, the answer is gonna be more obvious if I, for example, call it with f of two, because it's gonna be the same for every single call of f. So if I call it with f of two, well, I'm gonna get zero here. So first things first, here, the first call of f of 2, let's see what it does. Well, it says, okay, x is 2, so definitely it's not, not going to enter in here. It's going to actually print on the screen something and return f of x minus 1. So let's note that down. Let's say this is the return value we get. So return f of x minus 1. Now, we don't know what that is, so we're going to have to execute f of x minus 1. But we know that x is 2, right? So in that case, we're going to actually call f of 1. Okay, so this is the return value. Let me actually name it like so. Now, f of 1 means that x is 1. Okay, then it doesn't enter this if. It does print something on the screen, and then it does f of x minus 1. Well, f of x minus 1, if x is just 1, is 0. So this return statement, since we have here a return, turn, turns it in, into f of 0. Okay, so f of 1 returns f of 0, which, what does it return? So f of 0 is x equals 0. It doesn't enter here because 0 is not less than 0. It prints it on the screen. We can see that down here. And then it calls f of 0 minus 1, which is f of minus 1. So we have here minus 1 instead. And then once we get there, x is minus 1 and it enters this if statement and it simply returns zero. So f of minus one is actually gonna be zero. So of course we're gonna get as a result zero. I want to do a small exercise with you on this topic. Uh, let's say we want a function that what it does is given a number, it sums up all the numbers from zero up until that number. So for example, if I give it, let's say number four, it should give me one plus two plus three plus four, which is 10. So it should give me as a result 10. If I give it a higher number, it should give me a sum of all those numbers from zero to that number. 
how do we do that? How do we adapt this f function to do something like that? Now we know that at each iteration, iteration of this f function, x is a different number and it goes down from the whatever x we give it first and then down to zero. Well, that's perfect because in here we have all the numbers from zero to that number. So if we give f the number four, we actually get all these numbers, but we're not summing them in any way. How do we, how can we actually sum them? Well, we're gonna have to play around with the return statement here. And at each, consider each addition an iteration of the f function. Well, let's say we pass in here f of four, right? Like we have up here, okay? The first iteration is gonna have us at x equals four. So it's gonna be for this addition, right? From the left to right. And actually I'm gonna change the order the way I'm doing this addition so that it's like this, okay? And then we're gonna have here, this be the first iteration, and then we have an addition of something. And that something is, well, what this function does, except for the number previous to the current one. So instead of f of four, it's actually a call to f of three. And what do we have here? Exactly that. So if x is four, we actually get four minus one, and that's three, so we actually call f of three. But we need to also add this value to the return, to the return statement, and that is, well, four is the current x value. So I'm gonna say here x plus f of x minus one, all right? And now if we try to launch this, we will get a result that is correct. We're gonna get 10, right? And if we pass a number bigger than uh, four, passing for example, 10, we should get, yeah, that is correct, four, uh, 55. Okay, so we did decide how to do all this, but how does this actually work? Well, you can always uh, try to take a look at the first return value of the first iteration and keep on expanding it, right? So if we have here, let's go back to four because it's simpler f of four is first called from the main function, right? So we go here, f of four, x is four, all right? And we print out something on the screen, we don't, that doesn't really matter. But here, what do we actually do? Well, we do return x plus f of x minus one, but what are the actual values? Well, x is definitely four, right? And in here, x minus one is four minus one, which is f of three, so we call f of three. Now we have to see its value, what it is. So we take a look, f of three is when f is three, when x is three, I mean, uh, we print something on the screen and we say return x plus f of x minus one. But this time x is actually three. So instead of f of three, we actually have x plus f of x minus one, which is in this case, three plus f of three minus one, which is two. And note here that we have different x's. At each iteration of the function, we get a different x variable. Just because they are named the same doesn't mean they are the same, okay? That's very important. Nice, now we call f of two, and we go ahead and take a look, and we can see that it's, again, x plus f of x minus one, but this time x is two, right? It's not that, that it's not that there's a single x variable, by the way, that changes. It's that there are as many x local variables as you have uh, function calls or iterations of that recursive function, right? So f of two is gonna be uh, translated to two plus f of two minus one, which is one, okay? And then f of one, well, it's gonna go down here again. It's gonna say one plus f of one minus one, which is zero, okay? Then f of zero, what it's gonna do? Well, it's gonna go ahead and uh, say, okay, x is zero. It's not gonna enter here. It's gonna return, well, zero plus f of zero minus one. Okay, fine. And then f of zero minus one is gonna be just f of minus one, which is gonna give us, well, since x is minus one is less than zero, now it's gonna actually go into this branch and just return zero. So you can replace this with a zero. And there you go, you have four plus three plus two plus one, plus two, plus zero plus zero. So that's how we got to 10. If you actually add them all up, you do actually get 10. 
Now, of course, you can actually um, optimize this a little bit and not have this last zero here if you change this to be equal to zero. So if x is actually at zero, it should return zero. That's gonna be a bit better and it's gonna not have us add zero twice to our uh, integral. But this is how uh, recursiveness works, right? It keeps on compounding to the same uh, return value or maybe the same uh, return values, maybe there's an array that it keeps on adding to and it does basically the same step, the same uh, set of operations. In this case, it was just adding two numbers, but it could be much a much larger step with these parameters. And at one point it gets to the end and that end is specified here. This is where the operation ends and this is where I want it to stop because, well, for example, for this operation, right, I have from four to zero, I want it to stop at zero. I don't want to keep adding numbers in the negatives. I don't want to see four plus three plus two plus one plus zero plus negative one plus negative two and so on and so forth till infinity, right? I just want to stop at zero and that is the stop, the exit condition for our recursive function. Now there's all sorts of things you can do with recursive functions. And I'm gonna give you two homeworks that I think you should try doing because it's not gonna take more than let's say half an hour at most, right? Uh, one of them would be to actually sum them up in a different way and that it only sums up either the odd or even numbers. Instead of four giving us four plus three plus two plus one, it actually gives us four plus two plus zero, which should be giving us six. So uh, the step should be two, not just one. How do you do that? Well, we're gonna have to find out. And another cool trick would be to actually get the sum of all the digits of a number recursively. So for example, if I give it um, 150, let's say 156. If I give it 156, I want it to give me one plus five plus six, which should be 12. Now note here, this is not the exact order of the operation that you might have uh, to do, but because addition is associative, you can uh, do that addition in any order. But these two exercises, I really think you should try, uh, at least try one of them. It's not gonna be that tough. That is for today. If you do have any questions, leave them down in the comments below or on our Discord server. The source code for uh, this video will be found on our website, link in the description below. Take care, bye.